Hello. Ciao. Ciao, benvenuti a tutti. Welcome. Welcome to this uh, last uh, Creative Mornings before summer vacation. I'm Maria Chiara, I'm the host of uh, Creative Mornings Milano. Here with me are other members of the team. So if you have any question, if uh, you have the idea of you want to participate in Creative Mornings team, whatever, you can ask them or me after the, the presentation. The theme of July is uh, treasure. It's been uh, illustrated by Inspector Jones. Um, What's a treasure? Treasure is something that is close to your heart. It's something uh, that is on your mind also when you're not there. I remember there is a, um, a movie about pirates, and they say pirates have just one ob obsession, the treasure. But the treasure, the treasure can be everything. <laughs> In this case, uh, our treasure could be today. Uh, so what we want to invite you to do is to find your obsession and let it guide you like a map, or find more than one and be able to change. Then there are other kinds of treasure, the objective, the goals, or the brands, for example. Then we, we will go uh, even to, into the subject later with Gaia. We thank you, uh, thank uh, Minchip, our main sponsor, as usual. Uh, they created uh, a series of content, especially uh, to, um, for all the queer community, so I invite you to go and check them out. Okay. As usual, uh, so we will start again in September. I invite everyone to bring a friend, also make friends here. I know that there are new people today. I hope there will be more and more new people in the next Creative Mornings. Thank you, Spaces, as usual. Uh, thank you to Margherita, the community manager that invited, invited us for the first time. And thank you to Spaces Turati, to our <laughs> barista there, and to everyone that is welcoming us uh, more and more every time we are coming back. We are coming back here in October with a surprise that will be shown later. Thank you to our sponsor, English Corner, that sponsored the presence of uh, Gaia today because she's coming from uh, London. She just come. Just landed. Uh, just landed, <laughs> basically. Uh, thank you to our team, as usual. So, this is me. This is our communication manager. This is our speaker relationship manager. There is Paula. There is Brigitte, who is here. There is Veronica, who is here. And there are, there are also other members that are working behind the scenes and are not here today. So yes, of course, the font of creating more than <laughs> is very complicated and no one has it instead of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's no problem. That's my problem. What is important is that we are more than 200 cities in the world. We are going to help Kyoto, Creative Mornings Open, exactly now, in these days. And we are very proud to help them. We are also helping uh, Palermo Creative Mornings to develop after a little hiatus. What is Creative Mornings for the new people here? Uh, our um, focus is creativity, but creativity as a means to welcome everyone, to welcome every identity, to welcome ideas, to welcome the possibility to change your idea. Why not? So everyone is welcome, especially. Thank you for being here. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to quickly change presentations between one and the other, so for then you're not seeing this. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, obviously, my name is Gaia. Thanks for being with us today and with me and for allowing me to have this space this morning, um, which I'm really, really grateful for, and to Creative Mornings for having me. Um, first of all, I would like to say sorry and apologize if my mind is a bit spacey this morning, but I landed at 5 a.m. this morning. My flight was supposed to arrive in Milan yesterday at 11. I landed at 5 30, so this was me this morning. <laughs> it's my fun time. But, um, I slept 30 minutes, so I'm not really sure I remember everything that I was planning to say to you today, but hopefully we'll be engaging anyway. 
Um, so before we delve into what I actually want to talk about today, which is kind of like what I do for a job, which is grand strategy, um, I think I'll try to introduce myself a little bit so that we get to know each other's and we understand why I'm talking about what I'm talking today. So uh, my name is, well, I'm from Rome. My name is Gaia, and as a kid, I really wanted to be a marine biologist, which probably is the dream of every 90s kid. Um, it didn't exactly end up like that. I ended up moving to something very remote from all ships and dolphins, uh, which is London. I moved in 2010 to attend a journalism and fashion marketing degree, uh, which I graduated from in 2013, which is me with a fringe, being a bit of an hipster, um, uh, uh, doing, the graduation, like doing my graduation thesis on the role of cultures. Um, in the diffusion of innovation theory. So basically what I wanted to assert in my dissertation and in the, in the investigate was how subcultures have historically been basically the main vehicle for innovation to spread in markets and how then those innovations that, that were co-opted by subcultures were then adopted by mainstream culture and became popular. And the case studies that I did was on hipsters. So being an hipster, I did a thesis on hipsters, um, which might sound really lame right now, but if you remember, if you're there in 2010 and then you're a millennial like I am, you remember that this was the big culture in 2010 and this was the main cool style that was going around. So when I graduated, I really didn't exactly know what I wanted to be. Uh, this was my ideal mood code. This is who I aspired to be. Um, there's obviously directors, writers, a couple of songwriters and band members, so we've got Kim Gordon, Stevie Nicks, John Dillon, Sofia Coppola. This was the mood board, and then this is what I tried to be by moving to London. Obviously, I wanted to be a stupid blonde in fashion, writing about fashion and lifestyle, hoping I would become some type of Rachel Green, which isn't exactly what happened. Um, it ended up looking a lot more like this. So me riding under my duvet and crying most of the days and smoking a thousand cigarettes, which I shouldn't be doing. Um, so as soon as I graduated, I didn't really want to do a master's. I wasn't pursuing an academic um, route. Um, I had an heading, which I'm really grateful that I did. I spent about a year after graduating interning for fashion magazine, uh, fashion like media titles, um, press offices. And despite it working, like looking kind of glamorous like it is here, it didn't exactly fit work. It wasn't glamorous at all. Um, it involved a lot of carrying very heavy suitcases of design and clothing around London in the heat of summer and basically making coffees for people. Does that mean that I didn't learn anything? Not necessarily. I, I think it's probably that year, between 2013 and 14, when I didn't have literally any money, I was splitting the 20 pounds that I was getting for expenses with my friend that was sitting over there. Um, I think I learned the most about the industry then, more than I ever learned in the following 10 years of my experience in the industry. So after one year of interning, I finally landed my first job, which was at this jewelry brand over here, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, it was a very small jewelry brand, um, independently owned, uh, stocked in a bunch of like different department stores around the world. I joined as a press coordinator and social media coordinator, which sounds really weird right now because in 2013 you would never think about joining PR with social media. But in 20, sorry, in 2023 you would never think of that. But in 2013, brands were just starting to understand the value of social media. So obviously they thought, oh, you know, it's a sort, it's a communication thing, so we'll merge it with PR roles. And that's what kind of happened to me. I joined a very small team as a press officer, and they were like, okay, yeah, here you go. Here's the social media account of the brand. You go and do your thing. So I started experimenting with social. Um, I'm really grateful that I had that kind of like really stuck up feel to the job at the beginning, because not being in corporate allowed me to do a lot of things, experiment with a lot of things that I wanted to do, test a lot, um, write a lot of stupid tweets, um, figure out what customers really wanted to see and what to engage with and what they didn't want to. I ended up staying at this brand for actually three years, um, which right now probably seems like a bit of a stupid choice. Sometimes I'm like, why did I stay there for three years? Uh, the reality is that I didn't really feel like I only left when I, when I felt that I had learned enough to make the, the jump to corporate, and that's how I landed at ASOS. I joined the brand experience team at ASOS um, in 2017, the beginning of 2017, which was an incredible experience. I spent 
basically the team at the time was divided in brand experience, which was basically the whole of marketing. And as smart as they are at ASOS, they basically like involve brand experience within content, social media, marketing, everything that was communication was brand experience. So even as a content and engagement team, like as a social media person, you will still respond to the, strategy, the global brand strategy for everything that you were doing. So despite my daily job looking a lot like this, um, it was actually, I had the opportunity to be exposed to a lot of like really top notch brand strategy at the time from one of the main players in the e-commerce uh, sector. Uh, I ended up leaving ASOS really sadly because the, the team was being restructured. Um, so I ended, up, I ended up leaving on my own accord, but um, I joined for six months an agency that did um, social media communication for luxury brands. It wasn't exactly my cup of tea. I didn't enjoy my time there. Um, and where I want to get with this is that if you see, obviously the difference going from this, oops, from this to this was really hard for me. And the reason why it was hard is that I really didn't understand the customer. So I didn't know who I was talking to. I had no idea who these people that were buying expensive jewelry, fine jewelry from a British heritage brand and great fragrances, which I now know today, but I had no idea who they were and why they were such an important luxury brand at the time, was really, really difficult for me and I really struggled to understand and engage the customers. Ended up leaving after six months, really depressed, and thank God I finally landed at Aeropress, which is where I am today. Um, a big whoa. I've been at Aeropress for four years, so for those who don't know it, um, which I'm not expecting you to, Aeropress is a global marketplace, it's a big of certified brand, means we're fully sustainable um, start to end to finish product. Um, it's powered by a band like an immense like a huge global community of creators. Um, similarly to Creative Morning, we believe like one of our brand beliefs is that creativity is for everyone and everyone should be allowed the tools to be creative. So what Aeropress does and what a mission is, is to enable creativity in a sustainable way and make everyone feel welcome in their efforts to become creative. So the, the way that Aeropress works is basically a marketplace, similarly to people, in a way. You come on the site, you upload your design for match, usually t-shirts, we're expanding into more products, but usually it's a t-shirt. Come on the platform, decide what you want to do with that design. Do you want to have it as a pre-order for one, two, three weeks? At the end of the campaign, we'll go and produce a t-shirt, we ship it worldwide, you don't have to think of anything. So obviously it's a great tool for creators that are starting from nothing because they don't really have to put anything up front. Um, the, beauty, the beauty of the platform is that it's something like that. It ended up being this beautiful platform for global charities, celebrities like Bella Form. Um, and then others to come on the platform and decide to fundraise for something that they really cared for. So the past four years we've been able to raise five hundred thousand pounds over five hundred thousand pounds for charities worldwide. That's Amnesty, it's a bunch of different grassroots uh, organizations in Palestine. Um, we set up funds for the for Ukraine war, for the Beirut explosions, for the Australian wildfires in twenty twenty, literally like the, from the biggest to the smallest coasts. Um, and yeah, we've been able to pay out seven million to creators and create this platform, which is really like a beautiful mix of creativity and meaning, which is what I find most engaging for me to work there. It's what I find most inspiring. So obviously you would think I have a creative job because I tend to do this, right? So you would think that because I work in constant run strategy, this is what I do all the time. I'm kind of with big, like with nice little platforms, produce nice t-shirts, good notebooks, and this is what my day looks like. In reality, this is what my day looks like. <laughs> it's a lot of project management, um, a lot, pretty boring. Uh, I don't like it, I don't think I'm really good at it, but I do it anyway. Uh, for the sake of making good things happen, uh, just because I feel when you have a good meaning behind what you're doing, you end up liking it. So a lot of my days, again, look like this. Um, I think being creative, it's kind of a bad word. Everyone wants to work in the creative world. No one really knows what working in the creative industry means, not even the people that work in the creative industries. Uh, for me, this is what creative process is. It can be anything. It can be from writing an Instagram post to putting um, a big strategy for a big brand collab 
Um, you're always going to go through phases. You're always going to hate what you're doing. And this is exactly what happened to me as I was doing this presentation. This is me on Sunday. This is me on Monday night. This is me last night at the airport, <laughs> changing the presentation completely because I wasn't really sure what I wanted to get out of this talk today. So because it was easy enough to talk about me, but I wasn't really sure what I wanted to communicate today. But I think I found the the connecting key this morning at about 4 a.m. Uh, in Gatwick Airport. And I think looking back at my experience so far, what I've always wanted to do has been connecting with other people. So whether that has been whether that has been through social media, producing content, um, writing, um, or creating brand partnerships and like going out to brands and charities and being like, hey, do you want to do something good together? What I really like is connecting. And the reason why I want to talk about connections today and then it's because at the base of connections is emotional intelligence which is something i really care personally and it's something that i try to bring into my day-to-day -day job every day whether that's with team interactions or in the actual job that i do so what is emotional intelligence so people define it for people that the big dictionary defines emotional intelligence as um, the ability to handle every interpersonal relationship for, with judgment and empathetic again. So obviously empathy is pretty key in having emotional intelligence. Uh, with empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. So does that mean you have to have that the same experience? Not necessarily, but it means that you're able to understand that experience with your emotional intelligence. So you know there's a heaps of research about empathy as you can imagine but what i stuck upon that i really liked was this journal from harvard business review in 2020 that defined how to build empathy which i thought was really applicable in brand strategy so it defines building empathy as embracing the fact that you don't know you don't know anything that you need to embrace the radical difference of others to really appreciate what their experience is, you have to commit to having that understanding and then you're gonna be able to embrace the community and foster that community. So obviously practicing empathy will then go and feed what in brand strategy is called an emotional capital. So um, when, let's make a step back for a second, when we talk about capital and that's how it got there from the team of treasure for creative mornings, was like, so treasure is something that you look at, that you want to find. And brands are always after these capitals. They talk obviously they're after physical capital in terms of money, but then they're also after emotional, cultural, social capital, human capital. Why do they want that? And what is a capital? So a capital is basically defined as any bank account. Imagine a bank account, every interaction that you have, any transaction is going to deplete or enrich that bank account. And it's exactly the same thing in brand strategy when you talk about having cultural capital, having community, having emotional capital, et cetera, et cetera, and human capital being the team. So how do brands build emotional capital? Um, it's through the power of storytelling. That's pretty self-explanatory. You know the brands for the past 100 years since they've existed, they've tried to like communicate the story. You have to express authenticity and you have to have emotional awareness. So that build, again, brings us back to empathy. Um, and this is how this girl, because she's actually younger than I am, Nadia Mesri, she's a founder, a startup founder, CEO at like 27 years old, she's founder of five startups. So, so she's one of those, but in one of her TED talks, she defined the more building emotional capital in this way, like in, um, with these three avenues. So the question is, actually, before I go to the next slide, we know brands want to build emotional capital, uh, but brands generally tend to think, and that's the main mistake, that if you build a great brand, people will come. And it doesn't really work like that. Like from experience, having it happens like so often at work that they come and they're like, we've got this great t-shirt, can you make something with it? And I'm like, well, not really. Like, what's the story? What, what, who created it? Who designed it? What, what am I going to tell about this? This t-shirt, like I know the Everest, for instance, has got, as any brand, you will have your values, right? So the values for Everest are be humble, stay creative, empower creativity, be humble, like the kind of Lamar song. Uh, stay empower creativity and um, give a shit. So I always need, whenever I do something, whenever I think about communicating something, I need to think of these three pillars. 
because it's not enough for me to be like we're a great brand for expect customers to actually engage and partners to actually want to connect with us so the thing is that building brands with emotional intelligence it's like in my opinion it's key because you can build the best brands but without understanding what goes behind the, behind the closed doors without understanding those treasures from your customers from your partners from your users it's going to feel like an empty party and you're going to end up looking sad like this little kid from that night is moving so the really the key that i think for any good marketer or at least what i'm trying to apply every day is to read the room so I have some aspirations about being a DJ. I'm not a great DJ, I'm a shit DJ. But um, what do DJs do when they go to parties? Think of a good, very good boiler room set. The magic of what happens in a very good boiler room set that you're going to watch on a laptop because you're not there. What you really enjoy, yes, is the music, yes, the music. They might get the best DJs. But really, what happens is the people are partying, the people are engaging, the people are really happy, and the DJ itself, because they're reading the room. They're able to read the emotions and understand what people want to dance to and what they're going to get excited by. So being a marketer is not exactly, it's not that different. Um, <laughs> I've created a lot of memes with this. I'm hoping you appreciate them because it's like 10, 10 memes. Um, so as a marketer, you're kind of like that sad little person in the corner and you're just like always, always trying to like eavesdrop what people are saying. So. What is the key to read the room? Obviously, you're reading the room, which means you're understanding your customers with emotional intelligence, you're trying to connect, and then you've got to be able to foster that sense of community. So the community is a bit of a word, one of those words that I hate to use, but I don't really have a better word for it. Um, in uh, Again, one other of my favorite brand strategies um, in recent years, this lady called Anna, called Anna Angelic, um, she's now the Head of brand at um, what's it called? They recall that iceberg, like that very that like, 90s brand, and she managed to like make something amazing out of it. And it was a very dead brand. So Anna Delic in her latest journal, um, she explains like the four C's of brand building as having community, culture, and creation and collaboration. So we're not really gonna delve, gonna go deep into all of them because that's gonna be a bit boring, and I'm not here. But the two key words that we're using today, the community and culture, those are the two treasures that despite being annoying bad words, I really want to focus on. So other than emotional candor, I need to drink some water. Um, the other big capital that runs and runs strategy are constantly after is cultural capital. The problem with culture becoming something so on like on the mind of everyone is that obviously Culture is really different, difficult to make up. You can make up culture. Make up like culture, you can manufacture it in like meetings. We can sit here and be like, okay, this is the culture of these brands. We can say what the culture today of is of creative mornings, right? We can all sit together, we can get to know each other, so we can be like, wow, that was a great vibe, and that's the culture that we're bringing to the space. But we brand building is not that easy. So another in another brief, another, one of the big papers that I read before, because I had ideas, but I wanted people to like confirm that I had the good ideas, so I read a lot before doing this talk. Um, and then I found this really interesting journal where this guy that works at Ogilvy, Ogilvy is like one of the main communication agencies around the world. Um, he's defining like this paper from 2018, so obviously it's a bit, you have to meet people you want to read out of it because it's before pandemic so not all of it is relevant but he defines the work that basically the journey of brands from brands being symbols imagine a switch for nike brands becoming story and building a narrative and then brands are now like into, like this this day and age becoming systems so one of the greatest like one of the easiest examples to make is obviously nike imagine the nike switch Nike has become something with a narrative, something that people know exactly what they're talking about when they tell you to just do it, to go out there and run, to become an athlete, to be an athlete that feel an athlete, and then they become a system. So when we're talking about brand systems, it's basically imagining um, Nike as like having obviously the main brand, and then there's Nike Run, there's Nike Run Club, there's Nike Women, Nike Football, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that system has was born because customers were asking for that system to be born. 
um, because they were like having just one brand wasn't enough. So the reason why Nike, Oxygen, and like, many other sponsor brands do it particularly well, better than luxury brands in my in my idea. But the reason why it works so well is because that system has been done. Am I running out of time? Oh. Um, that system has been um, has been built with the customers. So the problem though that brands there's not a the problem, but let's say that like the issue is that brands have evolved from being tokens of culture to being tools of culture and that's really the difficult thing to do as a brand strategy to understand how you do that job because you don't want to be tokenistic you do want to become something that people actually believe in and they want to be involved in that system so obviously the example of nike is that people don't use nike to be to feel athletic they use nike to be an athlete and that's the whole difference and that's what they managed to do and what I think every branch does manage to do. But we have another problem, and that's maybe the last problem I'm going to talk about today, um, that building culture has become, because, because it has become a bit of an obsession for a lot of brands, brands are what, in, I mean, what I'm, I'm liking to, like, I want to call their washing era, so they're green washing, they're pink washing, they're rainbow washing, because they want to jump on so many bandwagons, they want to, but what I progress went through like as fast, like yesterday was um, non-binary uh, people visibility day. And we realized yesterday morning, because I keep a cultural calendar, but I can't keep track of every day. And then yesterday someone came to me and they were like, oh, we're not doing any like non-binary visibility day. And I was like, I don't have a story to say. Like I don't have anything to tell. I'm not gonna post something randomly just because we need to post an hashtag. I'm not doing it, I'm sorry. Because the problem, oh no, there was another meme. Oh, it's gone. Oh, maybe we'll find it. Yes, that's it. Um, so the problem, obviously, with culture is that when you're trying to like pink wash, rainbow wash, blah, 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 your brand voice is basically like this fake attempt to transform what happens between closed doors in a brand, like in a brand meeting, which is basically corporate bullshit, and you want to transform that into culture. So a lot of the times, this is what ends up happening. Um, which is like bring one of the surprise uh, and the, um, the green labels for the sustainable things uh, and the recycled garments, etc. etc. So, what's happening because of this is that the problem is that when we're trying to be, I'm going to read it out because it's actually really great, that when something tries to be human, yet imperceptibly it misses the mark, it gives us the EBG. So obviously we don't trust that voice anymore because it's not, it's manufactured, it's not real, it's not authentic. So obviously what's happening <laughs> is that we're developing trust issues and not just that, like not just the customers, we as marketers are developing trust issues because this is what happens. We tell people, this is a panda, lick a lick what's called lollipop, and then you take out the, the packaging and it's just a white lollipop. So that's disappointing and you don't want that to happen to your customers. Um, so obviously the trust issues that brands are facing is that people can be brands, but brands cannot be people, and that's being, that would deserve like a whole other talk about why celebrity brands are being so successful right now, and that's because the celebrity brand is basically a person. So it's so easy to build a brand around a person that's already a brand, like people. What, what's been happening in the last 15 years with obviously social media and everything that came after it is that people, we've been branding ourselves. Like we, I'm branding myself. I'm posting stuff on Instagram constantly being like, hey, I'm this great brand manager. I'm this great writer and DJ. I'm not. But it works. Like I'm doing some pretty good brand strategy for myself and that's what celebrities are doing and that's why people will trust a celebrity brand but struggle so much to trust new brands on the block. Um, and it's because they don't have that, uh, what's the word, that kind of like track record of being authentic and trustworthy. So, and I'm getting to the end of it. Brand building and successful brand building is basically like democracy. You have to listen to the people that use your brand, that want to come to your brand, that are your customers and are your users. So if people are asking you to be better, you can do that, but you need to do that with participation. This should be a bit more centered. It's all centered. Uh, but obviously, democracy it only works when everyone is engaged. So when we're asking customers, 
to engage with our manufactured campaigns where everyone is diverse, everything is great, look at us, we're so good. People are not going to trust us unless we're asking them to co-create it with us. And that's the treasure that I want to get to today. Um, so brand systems like the one of Nike, Patagonia, make all the examples that you want to make, only works when the customers are co-creating it with the people sitting in the board tables. So I've taken, taken the liberty of redoing my the forces from an Angelic and having all the forces that she was mentioning, but then adding the fifth, which is co-creation. So, and I'll leave it here. Um, only, I think that only by using that emotional intelligence and that, em emotional intelligence and that empathy that we're gonna be able to connect with our customers, co-create brands that are actually gonna work in the long term. So, that's double the quote, that's a mistake. Um, so I'm going to leave you with that, and obviously if that fails, try screaming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.